Hi, my name is Evan Pizent. I'm a graduate student at Rice University in Marcy O'Malley's Mechatronics and Haptic Interfaces Lab. In this workshop video, I'll be covering Syntax, an open source framework we've been developing for rendering vibrotactile feedback through audio interfaces. We'll start by answering the question, what is Syntax? Syntax is a framework that enables users to drive conventional vibrotactile actuators, such as voice coils and linear resonant actuators, with audio output devices connected to a personal computer. You can think of Syntax as being a synthesizer for vibrotactors or simply tactors. Syntax includes both an open source software component in the form of programming APIs and graphical user interfaces, as well as a hardware component consisting of actuator amplifiers and haptic displays. We developed Syntax to address three current trends in vibrotactile research. First, the field has begun moving away from delivering simple alert type buzzes to instead providing rich feedback to either encode information or realistically recreate tactile feedback we experience in the real world. Second, Tactile devices are now more commonly incorporating multiple actuators in the form of high-density arrays to localize feedback across different areas of the body. Finally, the advent of mainstream virtual reality systems has brought about new opportunities for vibrotactile feedback, while also introducing additional requirements such as the need for ultra-low latency control and the ability to alter feedback in real time in response to virtual events. Two traditional means of implementing tactile feedback are through commercial haptic controllers, such as the ubiquitous engineering acoustics control box, or through custom integrated circuits and PCB designs. Off-the-shelf controllers are great because they keep the time to implementation low and are easily integrated with existing software or research pipelines. However, these devices usually come at a substantial cost, which scales poorly with increasing actuator counts, and depending on the controller's capabilities, users may not be able to render the exact waveforms required for their application. Integrated circuits, on the other hand, are fairly cheap, but require significantly more time to implement and are more difficult to integrate since they use embedded communication protocols. Also, integrated circuits are often limited to a library of pre-recorded effects, which again may not meet everyone's needs. As researchers with limited time and resources, we would ideally like to have a control method that is inexpensive, easy to implement, and capable of providing as much creative freedom as possible. Another method of control which has seen some recent use is through audio output. If we consider that many tactors are little more than miniature speakers, it makes sense that we can use the same audio devices to drive them as we would use to drive headphones or loudspeakers. Fiber tector control through audio generally includes a host PC that runs an application or virtual environment. A software layer provides the mechanisms to synthesize tactile cues and send their digital representation to the digital to analog converter of the audio interface. Analog signals from the output of the audio device must then be amplified to appropriate power levels, where they go on to become vibrations felt through the actuators. If you wanted to implement this, chances are you already have most of the components you would need. Audio interfaces encompass a wide range of possibilities, including the simplest option, which is the headphone jack of your PC, USB and PCI surround sound cards, or professional devices which can support high output channel counts. The types of actuators we can drive with audio includes voice coils such as C2s from Engineering Acoustics, or tack hammers from Nanoport, as well as linear resonant actuators, which can be had in a variety of shapes and sizes. The two remaining areas that we need to address are software and power amplification. Regarding software, you might be inclined to purchase or find a free digital audio workstation program. Such tools provide the means to synthesize waveforms in a graphical user interface and play them over audio devices. However, since these tools are generally tailored towards audio production, you would probably find them to be overly complex for your haptic application. Furthermore, we need software which provides a programming API so that we can integrate them into our own applications. 
For power amplification, we could potentially use hobbyist stereo amplifiers such as those sold from online retailers like SparkFun or Adafruit. Unfortunately, these options usually aren't the highest quality and typically only support a maximum of two output channels. This is where Syntax comes in. Syntax first provides the software layer between your haptic application and your audio output device. Second, Syntax offers amplifier designs tailor-made for haptic applications with higher than normal channel output counts. On the software side, Syntax delivers programming APIs that abstract away opening communication with audio devices and low-level drivers. Syntax can work with virtually any commercial audio device. The API includes mechanisms to synthesize and play waveforms, as well as the ability to create sequences and patterns. A special feature of Syntax is its ability to spatialize waveforms over arrays of tactors. This feature lets you treat discrete tactile arrays as single continuous spaces and seamlessly blends the amplitudes of adjacent tactors depending on where you want the feedback to be felt. Syntax also includes a comprehensive library manager so that you can load and save cues on demand. Syntax saves cues using a custom file format that minimizes load times, so you can load cues on the fly in real-time applications. The library can also import and export existing haptic effects in formats such as WAVE and AIFF. You can program with Syntax in a number of languages including C++, C Sharp, and Python. Additional support for Unity Engine is also provided. An optional graphical user interface can be used as a companion to the programming APIs. Here you can rapidly iterate on haptic effects and test them out on your devices. On the hardware side, we provide open source designs for eight channel haptic amplifiers. Designs with standard audio connections including 3.5 mm and AES-59 connectors are available. The amplifiers use linear amplification and have differential ended inputs and outputs so you don't have to worry about the effects of electrical noise. Both designs take a standard 5 volt power supply and can provide around 3 watts of power on each channel, perfect for small to medium sized vibrotactors. Now that we have a general understanding of audio-driven haptics and syntax, we will start to explore the framework in detail. The remainder of this workshop will be structured as follows. First, we will cover the syntax amplifier kits, which were mailed out to workshop attendees. Next, we will take a look at programming with syntax using the Python API. Following this, we will give a brief demonstration of using the syntax GUI. We will end with an example project which uses Syntax to provide haptic feedback for a virtual reality application. We mailed 40 Syntax amplifier kits to attendees of the workshop. Sadly, we were unable to accommodate everyone due to demand, and so if you did not receive a kit, you can download CAD files and bill of materials for the amplifier from Syntax.org. We've made an effort to organize and package the PCB design files so that you can upload them directly to online PCB fabricators. If you're in the US and looking for a recommendation, all of the kits that we fabricated were assembled by Screaming Circuits. They can handle printing the PCB, sourcing the components, and assembling the boards. All you have to do is upload the files we provide. Of course, if you're up to it, the boards can be built by hand with relative ease. Each kit includes a Syntax amplifier with 3.5mm inputs, optional enclosing inserts and adhesive backed feet for the amplifier case, two pre-wired 10mm linear resonant actuators, the option of either a USB cable or AA battery pack for 5 volt power, a 3.5mm audio cable, and a screwdriver. To set up your kit, first connect 5 volts power to the green screw terminals. You can either use the included battery pack or the USB cable. If you're using the USB cable, you can connect to a free USB outlet on your PC if it provides power. Otherwise, any phone charging wall adapter will do. Next, connect the 3.5mm audio cable to input 0 and 1 of the amplifier and your PC audio output. Note that two channels are carried through just one cable since it's typically used for left and right audio output. 
Finally, connect your connectors to output channels 0 and 1. Make sure that the triangle indicator on the connector is placed on 0 plus. Now that your kit is set up, let's proceed to download the latest release of Syntax. Navigate to www.syntax.org and click the Download tab. This will take you to the release page of the Syntax GitHub repository. Download the release that matches your operating system. Currently, Windows and Mac OS are supported. If you're using Linux, you can attempt to build Syntax from the source code on the master repository. Follow the building tutorials on syntax.org. When the download completes, extract the contents to a directory of your choice. Each release contains pre-compiled binaries for the C, c -sharp, Python, and Unity bindings, as well as the graphical user interface. Now we will introduce the Syntax Programming API. For this part of the tutorial, we will be using the Python API since it's the easiest to understand and demonstrate. However, feel free to explore the other language bindings if you choose. The API is nearly identical between all languages with a few minor exceptions. On syntax.org, you can find identical tutorials for each language binding, so you can easily see how each compare and what differences exist. Back to our Python tutorial, first install Python 3 if you don't already have it installed. Navigate to the Python folder of your Syntax release download and create a new working file named iros2020.py. Open this file in an editor of your choice. Visual Studio Code is a great option if you're looking for a recommendation. We'll start by using Syntax to open an audio device. Note that you don't need a special audio device for this tutorial, as we'll be using our speaker outputs. First, we will import the Syntax library, which is located in the file syntax.py within the current directory, and then create a Syntax session. Sessions handle the opening and closing of devices, as well as the playing of cues on the open device's output channels. We can query the session to see what audio devices are available on our computer. Run the script from a terminal, and a listing of all devices will be printed. A device is considered to be the pairing of an actual hardware device and a possible driver API under which it can be opened. Most devices can be opened under a number of APIs, especially on Windows, so you may see redundant device listings. Not all APIs are created equal, as some display far superior latency performance to others. In particular, you should prefer WDM, KS, Wasapi, or Osseo if your device supports them. This is less of a concern on Mac OS, where core audio is the standard and best driver available. Consult our transactions on Haptic's paper if you want to learn more about driver selection. Each device driver API pair has a unique index number through which it can be opened. You can also open a device by name and the preferred API. If you provide no function arguments, the system default device will be opened. This is usually your computer speaker output and is what we will be using for this tutorial. Once we have an open device, we can start to create and play haptic effects. Waveforms and syntax are created by instantiating and mixing signals. Signals may be oscillating waveforms such as a sine wave, or envelopes which give waveforms shape and duration. Each signal has a length or amount of time it will be played. The length may be infinite for oscillator type signals, or finite for envelope type signals. We can mix two signals through simple arithmetic operators. The length of the resulting signal will be governed by the lengths of the signals that created it and the way in which they were combined. When we're happy with the signal we've created, we can use our session to play it on a desired output channel. Syntax runs asynchronously, and all function calls are non-blocking. Therefore, we will tell Python to sleep so that the signal can be played before the application terminates. If you run your script from the terminal again, you will see that tactors on channels 0 and 1 vibrate for 2 seconds each. There are a number of built-in signal types in syntax. Oscillators or generators produce a base waveform and have infinite length. These include basic oscillators like sine, square, saw, and triangle, as well as special oscillators for chirps, amplitude and frequency modulation, and others. Envelopes are signals that have a finite length and are typically used to shape the amplitude and duration of an underlying oscillator signal. You can create basic envelopes, 
Audio-centric envelopes such as a tax sustained release, exponentially decaying envelopes, or even envelopes from cubic Bezier curves. A final class of signals referred to as processes take one or more signals and perform operations on them. These include simple arithmetic operations such as sums and products, as well as processes which repeat, stretch, reverse, or sequence other signals. Let's take a look at how we can mix signals in syntax. We'll start by creating three signals, a 100 Hz square wave, a 10 Hz sine wave, and a 0.3 second ASR envelope. In our first example, we can modulate the amplitude of our square wave with our sine wave. This mix signal will have an infinite duration. If we wanted to give our signal a finite duration, we could further multiply it by our ASR envelope. You can mix signals however you like and even include scalar values to adjust the gain or bias. Go ahead and play one of these mix signals to see how it feels. Multiple signals can also be easily sequenced in time to create patterns of effects. Suppose we have two signals, sig A and sig B, that we want to sequence. The simplest sequence would be their direct concatenation, which we can create through the insertion operator. We can insert scalar values into our sequence to create delay and pause as well. A negative scalar value can be used to crossfade our signals into each other. Since sequences are just signals themselves, we can also create sequences of sequences. One of Syntax's unique features is the spatializer. Spatializers help us play signals on multi-actuator displays or tactile arrays. Consider this extremely simple tactile display with two actuators isolated by a foam block. Let's create the illusion that vibration is traveling back and forth between each actuator. We'll start by creating a spatializer from our current session and setting the virtual position of each actuator channel. We will initialize the target position of our spatializer to the center of our coordinate system. We can set the radius of our target location, which Syntax will use to calculate the amount of signal that should be sent to each actuator. Next, we can play a basic sine wave on our spatializer. If we stopped here, nothing particularly interesting would happen and each tactor would faintly vibrate. So let's create a 10 second loop that moves our target location back and forth with sinusoidal motion. Now when we play our script, the source of vibration will appear to ping pong back and forth between our actuators. The amplitude of each actuator will be scaled based on its virtual proximity to the target location and the radius of the target. By default, amplitudes will be scaled according to a linear drop-off law but you can change this to exponential, logarithmic, or other drop-off laws. Spatializers are most interesting on high-density arrays, which will be demonstrated later in this workshop. This example was only one-dimensional, but spatializers can be two-dimensional and can also be set to wrap around so that you can create circular, cylindrical, or spherical manifolds. Finally, let's take a look at Syntax's library facilities. Suppose you just created an awesome signal that you want to save and play later. Simply call library.savesignal, passing the signal to be saved and the string name you want to reference it by. Later, you can load the signal back in at runtime using library.loadsignal and the original string name. Signals are saved to a globally accessible location on your computer, so you don't need to worry about output directories or where you saved a particular signal. Signals created in one syntax language binding can be loaded by all other language bindings, so sharing effects across applications or between users is easy. Only the parameters needed to recreate the signal at runtime are saved, so compared with audio formats such as WAVE, which stores all audio samples, syntax files can be loaded more quickly on the fly for real-time applications. Nonetheless, syntax can import haptic effects saved in audio files, or export signals to audio files if you want to use them in another application. In the next part of this workshop, we're going to take a look at the Syntax graphical user interface. The Syntax GUI can be thought of as a companion application to the core programming API. It's a great way to rapidly prototype effects for your haptic displays before you start any real programming. And if you're not the programming type, a lot of interesting work can still be accomplished with the GUI alone. The GUI can be opened by launching syntax underscore GUI.exe. 
If your operating system complains about the program being unrecognized, you may have to change the permissions of the executable. Consult syntax.org for more information. The GUI is composed of six main widget areas. The device bar allows you to select your desired device, driver API, and sampling rate. The palette and library widget stores the built-in syntax signals and lists all of the signals saved in your library. The workspace area in the center is where we can design, sequence, and spatialize signals in the same way that we did previously. The visualizer widget graphically renders the signal of interest. The player widget allows us to play the current signal or signals from our library on the output channels of the open device. Lastly, the info bar displays helpful tooltips and diagnostic information about the current syntax session. Let's take a deep dive into using the syntax GUI. When the GUI is launched for the first time, the system default device will be opened. We can select available devices based on driver API and device names. We can also select a non-standard sampling rate if desired. You can get a list of all available devices using the button in the top right. System and API defaults are denoted by an asterisk. As before, we will select our speaker output device. At any time, you can get helpful information and tips on how to use the GUI by dragging the question mark icon from the info bar onto areas of interest. The GUI is also thoroughly documented on syntax.org. Let's use the GUI to design a new signal. We'll start by clearing the current workspace area so that we have a blank slate. We can drag items from the palette widget into nodes of the designer tab. Context-aware inputs will allow us to modify the parameters of signals. We can continue to drag items from the palette to create our desired signal. For instance, here we've created an amplitude modulated sine wave. Let's put syntax to the test and see if we can create a realistic heartbeat. To do this, we'll use one of the envelopes we haven't explored yet, the polybezier. We'll drag it into a node and change its overall duration to a quarter of a second. We can use the spline editor to sculpt an amplitude for our base 120 Hz sine wave. This will serve as a template that we can repeat for our heartbeat effect. We'll hop over to the library tab and temporarily save it. Notice the signal MySig that we saved previously from the Python tutorial. We can inspect the signal and play it if we desired. It's worth noting now that signals saved from the GUI can be loaded from the programming APIs, a particularly useful feature that will be demonstrated later. Now we can switch to the Sequencer tab and drag in our single heartbeat two times. You can drag items onto the plus icon to add it to the end of the sequence or directly into the timeline. We can expand the controls on the second repetition where we can easily reduce the gain of the second beat. When we are done, we can save this as another template for our final heartbeat effect. To wrap up our design, we'll switch back to the Designer tab and clear the workspace. We'll use one of the process signals called repeater. Next, we can drag the two-beat sequence into the repeater signal slot. We'll increment the repetitions so we can see what we're doing and add just a bit of delay between each repetition. We want our heartbeat to play over and over again, so we'll crank up the repetitions all the way. Finally, let's play our heartbeat effect using the player widget. This seems like a solid first attempt, so we'll save the effect to our library. If we ever decide we want to modify the effect, we can easily edit existing signals saved in our library by right-clicking them and selecting Edit. From the library widget, we can also import signals from external sources by dragging them into the GUI window. We can edit and play them just as we would any other signal. As before, we can import haptic effects from audio files by dragging them into the GUI. Just for fun, let's import a song and see what happens. Imported files are treated just like any other signal, and as such, we can mix and modify them however we like. We'll use another one of our processes called a stretcher to slow this song down by a factor of two.
Finally, let's demo the Spatializer from the GUI. We'll switch over to the Spatializer tab where we are presented with a grid editor. We can drag channels from the Player tab to put them into the Spatializer coordinate system. Since we are only working with two channels for this demo, we'll clear this and reinsert channels 0 and 1 similar to how we did in the Python tutorial. We can drag our heartbeat into the signal slot of the Spatializer and play it. Using right mouse drag, we can move the target position around the grid and feel the change in amplitude on our tactors. Notice how the volume of each channel changes with the target position. Scrolling the mouse wheel will increase the target radius. Here you can see a few of the options we have for drop-off laws. We'll switch to a logarithmic drop-off so that amplitude ramps up and fades down quickly as the target approaches. Now that we've covered Syntax's programming APIs and GUI, you're probably ready to see some real-life examples. We've created two example projects complete with source code as well as CAD files for two original haptic displays. Both projects are available at syntax.org in their entirety. The first project consists of a 24-channel haptic display in the form of a 3x8 tactile array. The array is meant to be driven by three Syntax amplifiers and a Motu 24AO audio device. We've created a simple application that allows you to draw tactile patterns or phrases and play them back on the display's tactors. This example should serve as a good reference for using Syntax's Spatializer for high-density displays. Our second project demonstrates a haptic bracelet. The bracelet is 3D printable and contains eight linear resonant actuators spaced evenly around the wrist. For the remainder of this workshop, we will be showing how you can use Syntax and the bracelet to provide haptic feedback for hand interactions in VR. First, we are going to create a virtual representation of our bracelet. We'll create a user interface that allows us to play vibrations on individual tactors, as well as in a continuous spatialized mode. Next, we will develop a tennis racket and ball interaction. We will use our bracelet interface to provide haptic feedback when the ball collides with the racket or environment. Finally, we will explore feedback for a virtual desk fan. The fan has multiple points of interaction including knobs and buttons that we will develop feedback for. We will also attempt to render the sensation of air when the user moves their hand in the fan wind stream. Before we get started, there are a few implementation details we should cover. This example is created in Unity Engine and therefore we will be using Syntax Unity Assets and the c -sharp API. We are developing for the original Oculus Rift headset, but we will be using the Steam VR SDK so that we can abstract away headset APIs and substitute different headsets later if we need to. Steam VR also provides a nice SDK for animating hands and creating interactable objects. As mentioned, the Syntax bracelet has eight 10 mm linear resonant actuators, and we will be driving it with the same amplifier kit that you have received. To utilize all eight channels of our amplifier, we won't be able to use our computer headphone output, and we will need to expand the number of audio outputs from our computer. The simplest option is to purchase a 7.1 surround sound card. These audio devices are fairly inexpensive and can be had in USB or PCI Express interfaces. We are using an ASUS Zonar AE PCIe card, which can be purchased from Amazon for about $70. Let's get started by integrating Syntax into Unity Engine. Syntax is easily added to any Unity project by importing the syntax.unity package file. Simply drag this file into your Unity Assets folder. This will add the plugin and two scripts, syntax.cs and syntaxhub.cs, to your project. Opening Syntax devices in Unity is facilitated by the Syntax Hub script. You can add the script to an empty game object in your hierarchy. A drop-down list allows us to select the mode in which Syntax will be initialized. Like the programming API, we can tell Syntax to open the default device or a specific device by name or index. The Syntax Hub script will open the device when your application starts and close the device when the application quits. The script also provides a listing of all available devices as well as some diagnostics information about the current session. 
The hub stores the current syntax session. Therefore, when we want to play signals, we simply get a reference to the syntax hub and access its session member variable. From here, we can use the syntax API just as we did in the Python tutorial. The c -sharp API can be referenced from the syntax.cs file. If you don't want to use the syntax hub script, you can create and manage the lifetime of sessions from your own scripts as well. Now we'll take a look at our virtual bracelet interface. We've created a prefab object with a few different scripts attached to it. Two utility scripts, Velocity Estimator and Control Display, will help us build interactions later on. The bracelet script will serve as our main entry point into the prefab. It will also associate the bracelet with a particular Steam VR hand and enable Steam VR action sets and controller mappings. The Tactor Array script will allow us to initialize the channels of all of our Tactors. It will also initialize and provide an interface for our Spatializer mode. We will configure our Spatializer so that the coordinate system is represented in degrees. Our first Tactor will be located at 45 degrees from the vertical, and our last Tactor will be at 0 or 360 degrees. We will enable Spatializer wrapping at 360 degrees so that we make a full circle around the bracelet. We'll be able to set any target position between negative infinity and positive infinity degrees, and the Spatializer will handle the amplitude scaling for us. We'll write similar wrapper functions around the Syntax API so that we can easily set the target position angle and total angle, play a signal, and scale the volume. Our bracelet prefab is also essentially a collection of smaller prefabs for each tactor, each with a tactor script attached. From here, we can vibrate individual tactors if we choose to. To visualize and debug, we can get the actual output level of each tactor and use it to linearly interpolate the color of our lid. Here's our final bracelet prefab, tracking the location of the user's virtual hand. Let's make sure our user is paying attention and give them a light jolt from the GUI. We can continue around the wrist and target each tactor. It looks like our user approves. Now let's start working on our tennis racket and ball. We've used SteamVR's interactable SDK to make these pick up objects. Inside of the SDK function on attached to hand, we'll lightly vibrate all of the bracelet tactors when the items are picked up. We can do something a little more interesting when our objects collide with each other. We will get a velocity estimate from the bracelet and remap it to an amplitude between 0.1 and 1. We use this amplitude to create a procedural exponentially decaying sinusoid. We also synchronize the haptic effect with audio effects from Unity. What a show off. Finally, we've come to our virtual desk fan. The fan has a few knobs and buttons we want to provide haptic feedback for. We'll use syntax to create signals for contact events, knob notch detents, and button clicks. Instead of programming these by hand, we'll use an approach that was mentioned earlier and design the effects in the syntax GUI. We can expose a few public strings so that we can enter the name of the syntax library signal from the Unity editor. Next, we can design our effects in the Syntax GUI and save them to our library. We'll add code to the appropriate functions to load the signals at runtime and play them. The neat thing about this approach is that we can edit and resave our signals in the Syntax GUI while the Unity application is running. This makes iterating on effect designs faster and more convenient than if you had to edit code and recompile the program. Now we'll take a stab at rendering the fan airstream. 
When the bracelet enters the stream, we'll enable our spatializer mode, create a new signal based on the fan blade speed with a touch of noise added on top, and then start playing the spatializer. We only want to target the tactors facing the source of the air. We also want to scale the vibration amplitude when the hands move closer to the blades. We can use the spatializer interface we set up earlier to do this. First, we'll compute a few variables related to the bracelet's position within the fan airstream. Next, we'll calculate a volume or amplitude based on our proximity and the target position we should supply to our spatializer. Finally, we can call our spatializer methods to scale the volume and set the target position. Here we've set the spatializer radius, or in this case the total angle of the target area, to a constant 135 degrees but this is a parameter we might also like to proceduralize. As a final demonstration of syntax, we can easily support two bracelets by simply hot swapping our audio device for a Motu 24AO and using the appropriate version of the syntax amplifier. In our code, all we have to do is change the device in our syntax hub and make a duplicate of our bracelet prefab. This concludes our workshop on Syntax. We hope you've enjoyed the presentation and consider using Syntax in your next project. We are eager to hear feedback from the haptics and robotics communities, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions or suggestions, or consider posting an issue on our Syntax GitHub page. Once again, you can find source code and CAD files for everything that we presented in this video on the Syntax website. In closing, we'd like to thank all of the students in the Mahi Lab who have made this project possible. Thanks for watching.